Hello, I am Seema and welcome to part 17 of the chapter Redox Reactions. In the past few videos, I have been discussing the topic Redox Reactions as the basis of titration and I have been explaining the different types of indicators to you. We are now going to understand the last type of indicator where reactions or redox reactions where starch acts as an indicator. Starch can act, starch indicates iodine. Iodine in the presence of starch has a blue color and that blue, we use this uh, fact that iodine in the presence of starch turns it blue and we, any reaction which involves iodine that is the one where we can use starch as an indicator. And if iodine is present in the oxidized form, that is as I2, only then it is it, it indicates um, or starch indicates it. If it is present as the iodide ion, it does not indicate the color. So starch is used to indicate iodine. We need ions that can either reduce I2 to I negative or which can oxidize I negative to I2. What is the oxidation state of iodine? Uh, in I2 and I negative. In I negative, we know its oxidation state is minus 1. And in any elemental form, for I2, each of the iodines will have an oxidation state of 0. So when it is being converted from I2 to I negative, it is going from 0 to minus 1, that is, it is undergoing reduction. And when it is I negative to I2, the oxidation state is increasing from minus 1 to 0, therefore it is getting oxidized. So, when I2 is turning into I negative, I2 gives the blue color. So when I2 is turning into I negative, the blue color will disappear. That will be your end point. And when I negative is turning into I2, I2 as soon as it appears, it gives the blue color. So your end point would be when I negative is turning into I2, you will get the blue color on the presence of I2. So now there's a little trick here. If even a little bit of I2 is present, the uh, the starch would turn blue therefore you may expect that to be the end point right but that would actually not be the end point because when all of the uh, i negative turns into i2 the blue color will keep on deepening and therefore the presence of that i2 of the blue color there would not signify the end point it will not be a sharp change at the end point so this will have to be done in kind of two steps. Let's understand how it is done. But first let us understand what the reactions are and how does starch act as that indicator. When I negative turns into I2, copper ions have the ability, this is the ion which is present, which can turn I negative into I2. That is, it can oxidize iodide ions into iodine. <coughs> so when this happens, blue color will appear. And when you have thiosulfate ions, Thiosulfate ions can turn I2 into I negative. It means it can reduce iodine. And as soon as I negative is formed, the blue color which was present as I2, that disappears. So disappearance, as long as a little bit of I2 is also present, the solution will still be blue in color. So that is what we, that is the step that we use. We carry out the titration in two steps. We first carry it out with copper ions or any ion which can uh, oxidize the I negative. And when it oxidizes the I negative, this is actually the redox reaction in which all of the I negative will get converted into I2. And when that happens, the end point you will see is the solution is turning blue and it turns deeper and deeper and deeper blue. But then the end point actually should be blue where um, all of the uh, iodine has been used up and then a sharp blue should appear at the end point, which does not happen. Therefore, in this first step, we carry out this reaction. In the second step, the whole solution now turns blue. In the second step, we take this solution which has all of the iodine, the amount of iodine formed would be fixed because you initially started with a certain amount of iodide ion. Once all of it has been converted into I2, that is when the iodine that is present in the solution, we make it react with thiosulfate ions. And this iodine gets converted into iodide. So in this solution, when you add the thiosulfate ions, what is going to happen? The iodine that is present in the solution, it will start reacting with the thiosulfate ion, resulting in I negative, and therefore the blue color becomes lighter and lighter. At the end point, that last drop of, thio of thiosulfate that you add, 
whose, whose concentration you know very well. That would use up the entire iodine and it would turn colorless. So the solution will turn from blue to colorless. And then you would use these, you would use what stoichiometric um, calculations in order to come to the conclusion how much of iodine was initially present. Therefore, starch is used as an indicator only for iodine. So at the end point, it will turn from blue to colorless. Iodine gives a blue color with starch. Iodine, although insoluble, it remains in the solution in the form of which contains potassium iodide in the form of potassium Ki3. It can be present in the solution as Ki3. This is just a fact that is to be known. The details of the titration are not there in your syllabus. Therefore, we will not go into the details of this. You just need to understand that this can take place in two steps where first the uh, formation of iodine will lead to the existence of a blue color, which will not make the end point clear to you. Therefore, you will then carry out the reaction with thiosulfate ions in order to use up that entire iodine. And once you do that, you get the amount of iodine present. Titrations, that is redox titrations, are of nine kinds and I've just listed out these titrations. Where you take iodine, iodine has two types of redox titrations and these are the different names of the titrations. This is just for your information, it's not in your syllabus, just uh, I'm only trying to impress you with a little information that I have. Uh, not that it is difficult for you to find it on the internet though. So. Anyway, the different types of titrations, redox titrations that you have are iodometric, iodimetric, serimetric, bromatometric titration, iodatometric, then you have dichromatometric, you have permanganatometric, nitric titration, and titanous chloride titration. These are the different types of titrations that can be carried out. Now, not missing out this last method, you know, sometimes you simply cannot use an indicator. You cannot use an indicator because the solution itself is colored and therefore a change in color will not be visible. You will not be able to see the end point or the solution is so, so, so dilute that even if the color was produced, you would hardly see it. Under such conditions where the ions are definitely present, the redox reaction is definitely taking place, but no indicator is helping you. With the help of no indicator can you tell whether or whatever was the concentration. In that case, you cannot carry out the titration using an indicator. In those cases, we use the potential, that is the difference, the potential difference created by that solution. We know all ionic solutions can conduct electricity. So we will make them conduct electricity and any deviation in the uh, potentiometer or any, uh, any current that is produced would be measured and that will give us an idea of the amount of ions present. So that is a titration in which we do not carry out the chemical process per se. We are using the electrical conductivity of the solution to give us an idea of the, to calculate the concentration of the solution. So this method is known as the potentiometric method. So in potentiometric method, when you have a solution which is extremely, extremely dilute and therefore even if the indicator is present, you cannot see the indicator, the indicator will not be useful, we use potentiometric method in that technique, in that, for that solution. Also, if the solution itself is colored and since it itself is colored, therefore it will, uh, even if it changes its color, the, the change in color will not be visible. So we use potentiometric method there also. Let me just read this now. It's a physical method to detect the end point. It is used for very dilute solutions or it is used for colored solutions. It is used where a suitable endpoint detection is not possible. In both these cases, a suitable endpoint detection would not be possible because uh, in for extremely dilute, you cannot see the color and for colored, you cannot see a color change. So that was redox titrations. Now, before I wind up this video, there is a small subtopic that I would like to uh, do. It says it is limitations of the concept of oxidation number. Let me do that also. Limitations of the concept of oxidation number. So we we'll change our topic here.
limitations of the concept of oxidation number. Now we understood redox reactions in terms of reduction and oxidation in terms of oxidation number. And if you remember, the processes of reduction and oxidation, the, it was defined at different times in different ways. Initially, the concept of redox or reduction and oxidation started with oxygen because ox itself was oxygen. So, oxidation and reduction were two processes. They were opposite processes and with time the definition evolved. The first definition that was given was that addition of oxygen to anything is called oxidation and removal of oxygen is known as reduction. Then it was found that those reactions which did not have oxygen at all but had hydrogen instead, it was found that anything which from which hydrogen was removed was oxidation and if hydrogen was added it was reduction. So now the definition had evolved. Then later it was found out that there were reactions which did not have either oxygen or hydrogen and yet there was a, uh, uh, the reaction was definitely a redox reaction. So the third definition was the removal of electrons was said to be oxidation and addition of electrons was said to be reduction. Now this definition was also given but then it was found that not just electrons by knowing who loses electrons or who gains electrons, if you see the nature of oxygen and hydrogen as elements, oxygen is electronegative and hydrogen is electropositive. So where you could not use any of these definitions, we started using the nature of the atom and what is being added or subtracted or, or removed on the, on the basis of their electronegativity, we defined the redox reactions. So what did we say? Oxygen is electronegative. So and on addition of oxygen, we say oxidation occurs. So we said on addition of electronegative element, Addition of electronegative element was oxidation and therefore removal of electronegative element was reduction. So if whatever was the nature in terms for an electronegative element, hydrogen was electropositive. So we wrote the definition in terms of hydrogen now. What did we say? That so in terms of hydrogen, we moved it to uh, related it to electropositive element removal of hydrogen is called high is called oxidation so removal of electropositive element was oxidation and addition of electropositive element was reduction now we understood how to calculate the oxidation number of each atom in a compound and after having understood that it gave us the change in oxidation number gave us an idea how many electrons were moving where. So we could track the movement of electrons simply by knowing the oxidation states of each atom in a compound and in the reaction mixture that is in the reactants and in the products that also gave us an idea of redox what was undergoing reduction what was going undergoing oxidation so on the basis of oxidation number we defined that an increase in oxidation number was oxidation and a decrease in oxidation number was reduction so the definition of redox reduction and oxidation has been evolving and it is still evolving Right now, scientists have a feeling that we need not really go into all these details. A complete transfer of electron need not take place. Because if you remember in chemistry, we always say nothing is an absolute. Nothing is black or white. If a, there is a covalent bond, there is a little bit of ionic character to it. If there's an ionic bond, there's a little bit of covalent character to it. If I'm good, there is a little bit of bad in me. So opposites, there are no extremes ever. That is nature, that is how the universe is made up, that is how matter is. Therefore, restricting oxidation and reduction only in terms of these is this, even these definitions, despite being so many, are still restricted. 
So what is the latest feeling that uh, scientists are having? They say that if there is a decrease in electron density, we would say that that substance is getting oxidized. So now there's a seventh definition, a decrease in electron density would be known as oxidation and an increase in electron density. This is not a complete transfer. It is just electron density that electrons when they start gathering towards one side, we say the substance is getting, if they start gathering to one side, that is there's an increase in the density, we call it reduction. And if there's a decrease, they are moving away from a certain part, we say that is reduction. So this is the limitation of, uh, of the concept of oxidation number is that this concept is still evolving. We have still not come to a final conclusion which would encompass every kind of reaction. So therefore, this would be the one limitation of the concept of oxidation number. With that, I will wind up today's video. If you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends, and please keep returning for more videos in chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.